So welcome to the day of intercession teaching. We're going through this, this book. We already had uh, some sessions in May and uh, we're going through the last half of the book. So I suggest if you haven't had the book, um, you purchase one and check the beginning. Uh, this first study is just a short one. It's a preparation. I feel as though every time we go through a, a session or a group of sessions, we need to just prepare the way. Uh, I can't go back over all the other sessions, but we found that intercession is not praying the right prayers. It's becoming the right person. Rich has just exhorted us and said that it's it, it's us becoming the God listens to people, not prayers. And so it's important that we prepare ourselves and be the right person. Well, we've been through all the studies. The, the beginning of the book, I looked at the, the legal battle of intercession. Because intercession is changing God's heart from judgment to mercy. So, unless you're under judgment, you can't intercede. People, they talk about intercession, but actually they're talking about petition. They're asking God for needs, and that's legitimate. Any needs you see in the world, the, the starving children, the persecuted church, that's petition. You're asking God for needs, that's legitimate. But intercession is not us praying our needs, it's God praying his needs through us. So unless you become a friend of God, unless you're the person, God will share his burdens, you can't intercede. That's the first point. The second point is that you can't intercede, you can't stand in the gap unless people are under judgment. Because you're asking God to change from judgment to mercy. So if the church isn't under judgment, if the world... People are not under judgment. You can't be an intercessor. You stand in the gap. I can't ask for an advocate, a solicitor, to defend me if I'm not accused. You don't need a solicitor unless you're accused. And so I don't think people understand the intercession. It's standing in the gap to avert God's judgment because you don't need an intercessor unless they're under judgment. Well, it's all in the other books. I can't go into that. But I've called this little... Introduction, preparing the way of the Lord. Uh, let's just read Isaiah 43. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. This is a prophecy. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Very important prophecy. Because this is Isaiah. And he, will see today, he was actually prophesying John the Baptist who would come in the spirit of Elijah. But John the Baptist also said it and he was prophesying for our present time. I believe that John the Baptist and Isaiah were actually prophesying of this very day, prepare the way of the Lord. It's applicable now to us. That, you know, prophecy is cyclic. It's not just fulfil once and then it's finished. The word of the Lord endureth forever until heaven and earth pass not one jot or tittle of the law and the prophets. So all the prophecies will not be fulfilled in their entirety until heaven and earth pass. That's after the millennium. There's a lot of prophecies got to be fulfilled in the thousand year reign of Christ. So it's exciting that we can fulfill prophecies that we thought somebody else fulfilled years ago. Jesus has got to fulfill the prophecy of Joseph appearing to his brethren and revealing himself and they all repent and say oh that's part of Isaiah isn't it the look on him who they pierced who's believed our report we esteemed him smitten of God that's Jesus appearing to Israel it's nothing to do with the church the church have hijacked Isaiah it's for, it's for Israel so intercessors stand between the judgment of God and a backslidden people God always sent the intercessors in the Bible, people to stand in the God, the judges, the prophets, and the people with the burden of the Lord. How many books start the burden of Nahum, the burden of Habakkuk, the burden of the Lord? That's, burdens are not nice, you know, they're heavy. An intercessor is not a, when I say not a happy person, they're pleased to be doing God's will, but they're carrying a burden. And a, a burden's not light. If it's light, it's not a burden. So if you want to be a happy, clappy Christian, that's great. 
but you can't be an intercessor, there's a price. You have to carry a burden, and it's not your burden. It's not what you decide. It's not the needs you see. It's, it's something God puts upon you. It might be physical, it might be mental, it may be spiritual, but it's a burden, you carry it. So I believe our job as intercessors, this may surprise people, they may disagree, it's not to pray for lost souls. I can't find any, any scripture to pray for lost souls. All the intercession has been done, actually. If you're trying to intercede for lost souls, surely you're negating what Jesus did on the cross. Has he not done everything that needs to be done? The commission to us is not pray for them. It's go into all the world and tell them the good news that the intercession was complete on the cross. Jesus stood between a, a dying, damned world and the judgment of God. He did it. He's done all the intercession. It's finished. Jesus said it's finished. So, so for salvation, we don't need to intercede. We need to go and tell them, look, the price has been paid. It's already paid. Jesus has done it. He stood in the gap. They don't have to intercede when they're sinners, and we don't have to see, intercede for them in that sense. I don't mean we shouldn't pray for our granny and who's not a Christian and our children. But it's not intercession. We don't need to stand in the gap. Jesus has done it. It's when you backslid them. So the intercessor's appeal is not to sinners, but to God, to turn him from judgment to mercy. Well, I hope I don't sound scaremongering, but I believe this is our last chance. I believe the return of Jesus is soon. I know people have said it at the end of the first millennium and, and this. But that's none of my business, what they've said. I, I, I believe it. Now they believed it, that's all right. Uh, it wasn't to be so. I believe I could see the return of Jesus. I actually believe it. 30 years ago, I didn't think so. I thought maybe my children would see it. But things are escalating so fast. And the revelation that God gave to us at Ballot Ministries about let play begin, how when the Twin Towers came down, it was the start of God giving permission for it to be fulfilled, for the earth to be trapped. Like Jesus said to Judas, what you've got to do, do quickly. He gave him permission to betray him, to start the process of his crucifixion. Jesus instigated it. And as soon as he gave him the sop and said that, Satan entered Judas. Satan couldn't have entered Judas, except Jesus gave him permission, said, what you've got to do, there's the sop. I'm allowing Satan to enter you now. And I believe when the Twin Towers came down because of the prophecy God gave us, God says, let play begin. He allowed Satan, and I've seen the escalation of how the world's preparing for World War Three. I believe it's very close, World War Three. Terrible times coming. And I don't think I'm scaremongering. And I don't need to prophesy. We know these things will happen. And the love of many will wax cold. So I believe it's our last chance. I, I'm appealing to Christians, you know, surely this is our last chance. And if it's not, I think we should act as though it is. Every generation should be desperate, shouldn't they, for the return of Jesus to, to, to turn the backslidden church to holiness. So we've a mammoth job on our hands, haven't we? It's the last chance of the church to come out of Babylon. God's people are always in Babylon. I think I've shown that in the books I've written. They, they just revert to it. Every revival is a new virgin little birth, a baby. But it's come out of the whore. You can't have a revival unless we're backslidden, can we? That's what it means to be revived. You must be dead. So every revival has been fresh and alive and virginal in that sense. But it's come out of the whore. And the church have a choice we've been talking about it before our meeting how after the first generation and even before we revert back we've been business practices in we're selling bits of the anointed tent where the holy ghost fell and we're marketing the worship music and it's it's so easy it happens time and time again and when the child grows up this pure virgin you know revival it prostitutes itself. It brings the world in the church again and becomes a daughter of Babylon. As, as... So the message of John the Baptist, it's the same as Elijah, is to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. I think I've shown what the message is. Elijah's not about the fire. It's about turning the hearts of God's children back to God. I'm going to look at the... Elijah and the, and the fire and the prophets of Baal, next study. Well, 
Well, it applies in the natural, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children. That, that's automatic, isn't it? You know, when a, a, a man finds Jesus, then his relationship with his wife, his children alter. And, and surely that's the gospel, to, to heal marriages, to heal the rift between fathers and children, pastors and flock, businessman and his, his workers. There should be unity. The devil's job is to cause disunity. God came, Jesus came, to reconcile man to God, husband to wife, father to children. So while in the natural is very well, but what about the spiritual? Surely it's to turn the hearts of the church back to the spiritual fathers. Surely it's time to go back to the Acts of the Apostles and see what the early church did, how they acted, how they lived, what was the message. We, we seem to have lost that. It's all about this new fire coming and new this. And, and there's nothing new under the sun, is there? I think it's time to to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers, to teach this generation what the fathers believed in and how they turned the world upside down, because we're not doing it. The church are not doing it. I don't care what they say. They can have mega churches. They can have all fallen about. They can have fire come down literally from heaven. It has no impression on me if it doesn't alter society. True revival will always alter society. John Wesley's a good example. His preaching saved England from civil war, according to historians. The Welsh revival, the pubs closed. They sang abide with me at rugby matches. I mean, so it has to affect society. And so the world is in darkness and light gets rid of darkness. So the church are not light. I don't care what they say. Doesn't matter, it doesn't impress me. Whatever they say, we're doing this, we're praying with politicians, the police force are doing this, and every year the laws are getting more and more pagan. Now, if they change, that's different. I'll say maybe we've stopped the tide. But at the moment, we haven't stopped the tide of paganistic laws in our country. So the, there's no light, because light gets rid of darkness. So there's something wrong with the church. They must be in Babylon, they must be backslidden by factual definitions, not by what we think and what we feel and what the so-called spirit says. Just open your eyes and look at the state of the country. Look at the state of America and of Europe. We've drifted so far away from the early church models, today's Christians have no idea of the freedom that that early church had in Christ. We're so religious. The best of Pentecostal churches are so formal and so religious. It's unbelievable how they go through a ritual, how they're not free, how they have a hierarchy, laity and clergy. That, that's, that was brought in with the Catholic Church. That was never in the early church. They had apostles and prophets, but that, there was never us and them. There was never the division. We're all one in Christ. They were free from church doctrine. Imagine that. Glory be. <laughs> the early church, they had no church doctrine, did they? The Catholic Church formulated that many years after Jesus died. But there was, there was no church doctrine. They had, the apostles' doctrine was the teachings of Jesus. What else could it have been? What I've received of the Lord, Paul says, I'll give to you. They could only talk about the teachings of Jesus and the miracles he did. There was no new calendar to replace the one God instituted. God had a calendar under the Old Covenant, but Jesus came to do away with the Old Covenant and bring a new one. And there's no calendar in the New Covenant. There's no special days and feasts and, and special meets. All the ceremonial laws are all done away with in Christ. They, they had a freedom. They didn't have Ash Wednesday and Shrove Tuesday and Easter and Christmas and all the, Those are all pagan feasts. That's nothing to do with the early church. They didn't have it. They were actually freed from the old ones. But, but we, we, we've got another calendar based on the sun instead of God's calendar, the moon. Instead of having no calendar and every day is wonderful, that doesn't mean we don't remember the feast because it's prophecy. But I'm talking about keeping it religious duties. Jesus said Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath wasn't to lock you in. In fact, even under the old covenant, it wasn't a religious day. They weren't told to go to the temple, they weren't told to pray, they were told to do nothing religious on the Sabbath. It was purely to rest from labours. It wasn't a spiritual day, if you read it. 
Unless it was a feast, they were def different, but the normal day-to-day -day living every Sabbath was a day to rest with your family from your labours. There was no instruction about anything spiritual. But we've, we've made it all religious and we've, we've, we've even un misunderstood the old covenant, never mind the new. So I believe the mixture now exists of paganism and truth. And it's so intertwined, hardly anyone knows the difference. It's understandable, 2,000 years of heresies, traditions, divisions, denominations, 2,000 years, that's a long time. So it's very difficult to, to, difficult to get back to your roots, you know. Well, in the end, in Revelation, if Jesus says, come out of her, Babylon, my people, what does that tell us? That God expected his people to be in Babylon in the last days. He wouldn't say, come out of her, don't forget, this is prophesied 2,000 years ago about Jesus' return. And, and, and he's prophesying the fall of Babylon. And he says, come out of her, my people. So he expects his people to keep going back in Babylon after every revival. He expects them. So he said, this is the last time. Behold, I come quickly. Come out because I'm going to judge Babylon. So if ever there was a time to come out, it's now. I could put a case for being in Babylon. Because when God put Israel in Babylon, he said, have families, have have work, plant vineyards. I've put you there. It's your punishment. And we're all born in Babylon. Even Jesus was born out the whore, because Israel were backslidden, they'd play the whore, according to the prophets. And Jesus was born when Israel were backslidden. So, so God handed Nebuchadnezzar the kingdom, the power and the glory. He said to Nebuchadnezzar, you're the king of kings. So he's either Christ or Antichrist with a title like that. You're the king of kings and I'm giving you, this is Daniel, I'm giving you the kingdom, the power and the glory. And he's had it ever since. Because in Jesus' day, Babylon ruled. They were under Rome. That's Babylon, isn't it? The statue. And we're still under Rome now. We've got the revived Roman Empire. Europe, haven't we? Europa. So, so we're still under Babylon. So it's all right. But if ever there was a time to come out, it, it's now. Well, the Laodicean church, if the church is a chronological, which I believe they are, Although they all apply to any age because the principles, aren't they? Left your first love. You've got the spirit of Balaam in. You've got this, that wrong. So that always applies to the church. But surely the chronological, surely the Laodicean church fits perfectly the situation we're in now. And what was the church? It was lukewarm, the mixture. There we go again. What's the mixture? Babylon. That's a description of Babylon, confusion, mixture. So, so the Laodicean church, it was a Babylonian church. In fact, I believe that Babylon moved to Turkey. That was, you know, spiritual Babylon, then to Rome. I think it's now it's worldwide. But, you know, the, the spiritual Babylon is not in a physical place. It's wherever it goes. And so th those seven churches, they were all in Babylon. Surely spiritual Babylon, because every one of them, you've left your first love. You've got the spirit of Balaam. You've got this wrong and that wrong. He's telling them the, the symptoms of Babylon. So Babylon was, was there in Turkey in those early days. And I believe then, you know, it ended up in Rome and wherever. So Babylon's not a different group than the church. The church is Babylon. That's a bold statement, I know. But it always has been, and it's okay. Israel were in Babylon, and they brought Babylon back to Israel. When they came back to Israel, they didn't leave Babylon. They brought Babylon with them in their hearts. The Babylonian Talmud is what Jews will worship, use today. Not the Torah, the Talmud, which is the writings, the oral, the writings of the, uh, the rabbis. The days of the week that we think, oh, Nisan and all these Jewish, they're not Jewish at all. They're Persian. Nisan is a Persian god. Just like we have Thor, you know, Thursday for Thor and Wednesday, Woden, we have names for Greek gods. So Israel imported the names back. They're not Jewish. God didn't put names to the days. He put numbers. On the first day of the month, on the third, 14th day of the seventh month, God uses numbers so it doesn't matter what name, does it? He uses numbers. He references sometimes in the Bible, so we know. But when, in the, when he gave them the days, he said that the moon is the first day of the month. 
and on the 14th day and on the you know seventh month the 14th day of the month tabernacles and so on and they brought synagogues back god never told them to worship in synagogues he says worship in jerusalem but they made local places of worship and they imported that and had synagogues that's why we've got churches we never meant to have buildings as holy places we need buildings we're in one now you need buildings to meet together that's great but when you call it a holy place and the house of god it can only be a pagan temple because you're the house of god so if you go to meet god at church it's it's pagan in, in essence that doesn't mean you shouldn't go to a building to meet god but we, we've got to get out of the mentality haven't we, where that's the church we're the church we're the living body it's difficult it's difficult i'm not trying to be over critical I, I just want us to, to to keep getting it in our mind so we'll have a little break we'll go to the next study today I want to look at the intercessory spirit in the story of Elijah because Elijah and the prophets of Baal is about intercession Maybe people don't realise it. it's nothing to do with anything else except intercession because that's the end of the matter. Everything else is a prerequisite or a, a progression to get to what's important. And what was important was intercession. So I want to go through that. And uh, some of you will have been through it because I've preached it before. But I wanted to do it in the context of intercession. And I've been blessed as I've gone through it again anyway. And uh, then I'm going to look at that manifestation of Elijah in John the Baptist. And I'm going to look at some of the intercessors in the New Testament. Simeon and Anna, we forget them, fantastic intercessors. Well, John the Baptist was preaching, doing the Elijah bit. They were in secret interceding. They were as important as John the Baptist preparing the way of the Lord. We always say, John the Baptist, he prepared the way of the Lord. No, he was the front man. He was the one who had fire and brimstone and is coming in judgment. But there's always those in secret. And those two in secret were interceding. And without them, I don't think it would have done the job. You need the preparation of the intercessors as well as the people who go in the spirit of Elijah. So we'll look at that and... Uh, God bless you. Let's have a break and uh, we'll have the first session.